thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, let's welcome Naveen Morshad. She's uh, teaching at Colgate University. She's also author of India's Bangladesh Problem, The Marginalization of Bengali Muslims in New Liberal Times, published last year by Cambridge University Press. Earlier, she authored The Politics of Refugees in South Asia, Identity, Resistance, Manipulation. It was published in 2013 by Rutledge. Uh, Naveen, what I understand, you have been quite active uh, in the recent movement that uh, overthrew Awami League and its uh, uh, leader, Asina Wajid's regime. Uh, could you please very briefly sum up for the international audience, which doesn't has, uh, doesn't, you know, or perhaps has not really followed the events that started unfolding in July in your country? Yes, I first thank you for having me here. It's it's a wonderful uh, speaking to you. And second, uh, I, I I wasn't really I didn't really play a very big role. I was I was there, um, and I had the uh, fortune of uh, observing a lot and and uh, participating a little bit. Um, but I think what's what's really interesting is uh, that you frame it as an an anti Hasina uh, movement, when in fact it actually wasn't that. That is not how it started, it started as a student movement and not even a progressive student movement, it's a pretty regressive student movement at that, right? So they were all fighting um, about uh, and protesting about uh, quotas in job placement, in a government job placement. Um, and uh, so uh, this was a, a movement that was already um, in place in 2018, a movement that had already happened in 2018 over uh, uh, quotas. Uh, so what was significant was that there, uh, there was uh, a requirement that 30% of the jobs would have to go to uh, children and grandchildren of those who fought in the war, uh, which is called the Mukti Juddha quota. Mukti Juddha means freedom fighter, so the freedom fighter quota. Um, and the um, uh, disagreement. Um, so, I, so I, I guess I say this to say that this is actually nuanced. So on the one hand, it's a regressive because uh, the students wanted, uh, some of the students wanted no quotas or they wanted quotas to be reduced. And, you know, quotas are a way in which that affirmative action um, is practiced in Bangladesh, right? You reserve a number of uh, seats for marginalized communities. Uh, and, and then, you know, there was this Mukti Juddha quota. So uh, the... the Contention part was the Mukti Juddha quota, um, especially when um, it was being applied to grandchildren and great grandchildren of Mukti Juddhas. So I think at a time when they were for the children of Mukti Juddhas, that was fine. But um, uh, you know the students were uh, not very happy about the fact that thirty percent of the jobs would be set for grandchildren and great grandchildren. Uh, so that was the contention, but this was a contention that was, um, you know, being discussed and uh, debated, and it, uh, it, it, um, you know, wasn't exactly a, a movement to uh, think about uh, you know, the downfall of uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Uh, it wasn't an anti-government. Um, protest at all, right? Uh, these were students uh, basically protesting because uh, this we were at a time where the economy was uh, not doing very well. Uh, we've seen uh, jobless growth, uh, if at all. And um, so in this context, uh, you know, students were having a difficult time finding job. Inflation was very high. You know, so there's a lot of anxiety among uh, students or graduating students uh, who worried about uh, their job prospects. Uh, and so that was the context of, of this. So, you know, I think you can think about it as uh, a way uh, in which students were protesting uh, dismal economic conditions. So the students were basically uh, protesting against really uh, a, a, a weak economy, right? And what they perceived to be uh, economic policies that were not serving their needs. Um, and so in that context, you, you see this uh, student quota movement. And when um, 
So they, they had uh, an eight point demand and then a nine point demand that uh, required different kinds of uh, re reforms uh, that would address um, the uh, inequality that they thought uh, uh, would need addressing. So this was a, a, a fairly, um, you know, timid experience, if, if you will, you know, the, so it, it wasn't one where uh, you would think that it would need a lot of intervention. Right? So uh, in 2018, which is when the first bout of these quota, uh, quota related protests started, um, the, the prime minister uh, basically brought in the students, she spoke to them, and then in a, in a sort of half said, okay, I'm going to uh, cancel all quotas. So, uh, and then since then there were no quotas, and then um, the the uh, judiciary basically said in 2024 that you would uh, have to bring that back. That 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 will uh, come up for review, and that's when this new bout of protests started. So, what was interesting is that um, you know the the student quotas were you know, an, an issue but not really a big issue uh they didn't really have much to do with um you know uh autocracy or about dictatorship or about hasina's rule because i think you know uh despite the fact that um you know there's been an authoritarian turn uh, sheikh hasina was actually able to to manage discontent in, you know, through a number of ways. Uh, she had the, uh, uh, you know, there, there was the perception that she's uh, able to maintain control, that she's able to keep a lid on things, that she's actually doing uh, good things. You know, so under her, we've seen lots of infrastructure de development, uh, the economy was doing fairly well. And um, despite a lot of, uh, 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 what can I say, um, you know, uh, anti-Hasina uh, sentiments, uh, she was able to sort of uh, put a lid on it. Right? But at the, at the same time, I think what we, we see here um, is basically the unleashing of these sentiments, right? When um, she went back during a, a press conference and used the uh, term Rajakar to... Um, implicitly indicate these students. So Rajakar uh, are those who uh, collaborated with uh, Pakistan during the 1971 uh, liberation war. Um, and so basically that means traitors, traitors to the nation, right? But you know, it, it has a particularity that it's usually used for the collaborators and traitors during the 1971 war. And we'd seen that, you know, on, on, over the last uh, uh, 15 years, um, there's been this uh, uh, way in which the uh, government, uh, Sheikh Hazina's government, sort of created uh, or fomented a kind of polarization that would pit freedom fighters versus Rajakars. You know, sort of almost creating this um, uh, entity, the Rajakar, that can be opposed uh, to uh, the Mukti Juddha, right? And so uh, she, she. Uh, so, you know, it, whenever there would be a time where uh, you would demand something and, and the state would not want to give it to you, they would uh, identify you as a Rajakar, like, you know, you're you're actually being a traitor, sort of like the anti-national kind of rhetoric that we see in India, right? You would you demand something and then suddenly you're an anti-national, right? So it's a, it's a similar kind of trope um, that that's used to delegitimize uh, demands that uh, people might have. So in this context, um, you know, she didn't directly say that you're Rajakar, but she said that, so who would we keep the uh, quotas for, if not for the children and grandchildren of um, the Mukti Juddha, would we reserve it for the children and grandchildren of Rajakar, right? Which, uh, um, and then she also said that, you know, uh, so why why is everyone... Uh, so upset or you know up and about about uh mukti juddha quotas right so in that so the students read it as okay you know again you're kind of trying to uh, uh identify us as uh rajakar so either you're a mukti juddha if you're not a mukti juddha then are you a rajakar right so uh that's that's what uh, was 
uh, heard, you know, there was some debate about, oh, no, that's not what she meant. She didn't really say that they were Rajakars. But, you know, this kind of framing, which kind of left it uh, uh, open for interpretation uh, in the context where this is often used to delegitimize demands was seen uh, in that fashion, right? And so in, in, I think uh, there were, you know, the, you know there, there's this possibility to interpret certain things, right? Um, so various chants started coming out. So I think this was a, this was a key moment, right? Because uh, until this period, they were primarily talking about quotas, right? When uh, when she uh, invoked the Rajakar trope, then we see this unleashing of a variety of slogans coming out of these student protests that identified the Rajakar. So, you know, Amike, Tumike, who am I, who are you, Rajakar, Rajakar, uh, 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 and, and and then they said, uh, so who who said it? It's the Shuirachar, the authoritarian government. And so the authoritarian government calls us uh, Rajakar, right? Um, and so you know, uh, because the first part of it was who am I, who are you, Rajakar, Rajakar. This the the uh, um, government, Sheikh Hasina in particular, sees it as oh, it's, look, they're self-identified Rajakars, right? So they choose they choose that part to say, look, they're they they are they are not even hiding the fact that they are Rajakars. And you know, this 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 massive sort of Outbursts were, um, you know, on social media. People were saying that, oh, those the Rajakars, you Bangladeshar, you know, leave the country. This that, and then the students came back to say that, you know, uh, uh, in in a in the spirit of you know taking back the term that you know who's a Rajakar now, who's a present day Rajakar? The present day Rajakar are the looters. The present day Rajakar are those who are siphoning off money uh, who you know uh, in in foreign countries because that's been a thing. So this this. Um, Mm, uh, this, this student movement this time around came um, at the heels of a number of scandals, a number of political scandals, right? Uh, where, uh, you know, every other day, you know, it, it turned into a thing that every morning we'd uh, 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 open the newspapers and think, so who's, who is it this time, right? Who, who's been exposed this time for laundering money, for, um, you know, engaging in some uh, kind of um, uh, economic scandal, right? Where th that would involve like a massive amounts of money that's being looted or taken away or something or the other, right? Um, so, um, and, or, or you know, scandals that would in involve uh, critical uh, individuals in key political institutions like the army, like the police, like, uh, you know, uh, members of parliament. And so, you know, all, you know, in the midst of all this uh, crisis, which I think heightened this sense of inequality, right? That on the one hand, and then, you know, there's this one point where the, where the prime minister said that, oh, you know, my peon makes um, 300 crore takas, you know, so which is which is a lot of money, right? So on the one hand, here are all these people, we hear about these people every day siphoning off uh, crores of taka. And on the other hand, you know, uh, people are fighting over jobs that would give them, I don't know, 12,000, 15,000 taka, right? So that, that kind of uh, inequality uh, was very uh, clear, very st obviously stark and, and very visible at the time. And so um, in this context, when uh, uh, the Rajakar trope became uh, uh, so politically uh, motivated by the state, used as, you know, for, for, for um, uh, you know, basically using identity politics as a way to uh, delegitimize again the demands of these students, uh, that became, you know, uh, um, I think uh, a key moment where uh, this became more than just a student movement, right? So if you sort of think about, you know, what are the critical moments when um, mm, uh, the, a student movement about quotas turns into an anti-government uh, protest, right, and then uh, you know, uh, you know, it essentially turns into a revolt, right? Um, and I would say this was one of those critical moments. Um, a, a key minister said, uh, "Chhatro League," and I think this was this was very important too. Chhatro League will give a fitting reply to those who said "Amike Tumike Rajakar." Right? They will have a fitting reply. And the fitting reply was basically Chatur League, the, the student wing of the Awami League, coming in 
uh, and uh, you know basically getting in into a fight basically beating up these students um and so uh, that's the moment when the protest becomes violent and this violence is what then uh, turns into uh, you know it keeps escalating right so there are all these critical points when the, when they um could have said that okay we will uh, talk to the students we'll negotiate with the students but Sheikh Hasina did not there were there was some sense that you know uh people were very upset about this use of violence right? Be because we were hearing that you know well the newspaper even these con conservative uh, and, and numbers indicated that you know um uh, people were dying at a fairly uh, uh high numbers so I'm, I'm I, you know I, I think at the at end of the, you know like a, a, a hundred hundred people at the end of the first day and then another maybe hundred so you know the numbers were a little iffy because you know the, the way that they counted body numbers were they had to be read uh, had, at, they had to be at the hospital um for them to uh, count it as a dead body but then there were others also so it was actually unclear how many dead bodies uh, there were and how many people were getting killed and there you know there were all kinds of numbers that we were hearing from um you know uh, during this curve uh, this, this sort of four day uh, blackout period that ranged from uh, about um uh, 200 and something to about five 500 and, and 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 more than that but whatever it was i think the entire style of it you know uh to to many people reeked of how india controls uh kashmir right that you, you know, there are blackouts that you use you know idf style helicopters uh you know shooting from the roof um you know sort of shooting indiscriminately what was particularly horrifying was um Mm, children getting shot. I think there were several children, you know, the, uh, kids playing on roofs, playing on verandas, uh, a kid looking out the window, you know, so it gives you a sense of how indiscriminate the firing was, right? That, you know, a, a couple of stories up, someone just looking out the window got, got shot, right? And, 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 and got killed, right? So th there was th this, this, this alarm. Um, and so it's in that context that, uh, this becomes an anti-government protest, right? At that point, you know, it was no longer about quotas. It was no longer about jobs. At the, you know, and that it's at that point that the prime minister says, "Okay, come, dear students, come talk to me. We are willing to talk. Uh, our our doors are open." And the students respond with saying that, "Okay, why don't you walk out of that door?" You know, because we don't we don't really want you anymore. You know, this is this is no longer about jobs. This is no longer about quotas. You know, uh, how 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 do you get to to shoot people in this fashion, right? So uh, that's you know I, I think so you know there there are all these little little you know so the the other other thing uh, um, you know I think that's that's uh, worth pointing out is that you know I jokingly say that you know this is these are uh, kids who sort of. Uh, memed their way through this revolt right there were like memes every day about what was happening you know and sort of the kind of changes and and so on you know many of them funny many of them sort of satirical and 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 you know so, so, so sort of uh, keeping alive this sense of protest right that you know in 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 very pithy forms actually communicating what exactly was the problem right and so i think in in that fashion I mean, it's, it's it's very clear that it's this uh in discriminate use of violence that really changed the nine point demands that had to basically do with um reforming the quotas uh to this one point demand of you know step down hasina that we don't we don't want you anymore right and so uh, uh I, I so i think in, in episodically uh there there were opportunities for the state to say that okay we made a mistake to apologize to step back to uh, um um uh, take uh, responsibility but um all of that happened very late right that you know uh, from uh, not speaking to students in the initial period to you know uh, trying to sort of uh bifurcate and co-opt the movement in the by identifying them as rajakars to then uh, using violence to um stop the protests uh you know in the name of oh there's some kind of conspiracy that we are trying to um uh, 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 we, are, we are trying to solve and you know so in you know there are all, all kinds of theories too so you know why is it and i think that was the surprise element why why are they using force like this there's nothing that you know a common person could 
see um, that happened. And you know, so of course, uh, you know, there are all these uh, uh, rumors that oh, you know, there, there are conspiracies that the state never shares, and they you know, that's why they're doing this. And uh, of course, us as common people, we will not know that. Right, uh, and that's why uh, uh, you know Sheikh Hasina came back from China early because they they knew that there's this conspiracy and that they're going to have to um, do something about it. Um, so you know all all kinds of um, you know rumor mongering uh, going on at the time, and uh, but I think you know uh, what throughout the period I think what baffled us was this uh, heavy handedness. There was no reason to be so violent there was no reason to use force in this fashion you know these were students right? there was there were just you know uh, it, it just felt uh completely uh disproportionate to the kind of uh demands that that were being made right and so once that happened you know even, even then so the, the the demand for uh, uh hasina's uh, resignation had come from other quarters the, it took uh, another day or two for the students to say that, okay, we want the same thing. We want Hasina to step down also. We want, this is a one point demand. And so when that happened, um, uh, it sort of became this this huge thing. And so um, what was what was interesting is that, you know, um, if, if you remember the 2013 Chabag uprising, which sort of had a very festive look in the uh, initial period, um, this too had that uh, uh, feel, despite the violence and so on. You know, so once the uh, blackout period was over um, and uh, people had internet again, uh, and they were sort of experimenting with it in different ways, people sort of used VPNs to get out of various restrictions, and they, uh, you know, and, and then there were there were sort of meetings announced, public meetings announced every day that people could participate in, and there. Uh, uh, the, mm, Interestingly, also, so there were curfews, but they would uh, uh, relax the curfew in the middle of the day. Uh, and for, for uh, you know, they were increasing uh, the the hours during which um, the curfew would be relaxed. Part of it was probably because of business interests, right? Because the business community was very upset uh, with all of that. Although I think the, you know, now that I think about it, I remember the a meeting that the prime minister had with the business community where most of them said that oh we are going to be with you throughout the whole period we are with you we want you for another 100 years that kind of not 100 years but you know we are going to be with you forever and ever we are your loyal um uh, subjects that kind of a thing um uh, and and uh, but please please help us with the economy i think that was that that was partly also i guess some rhetoric right you know we are we are giving you our loyalty just you know please help us with this economy don't don't shut it down because even in that four days there were lots of losses as i said we were already um you know facing high inflation low reserves you know uh, uh, um a weakening uh taka so these these were already concerns with for, you know the, the that 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 week of shutdown that was that had a heavy economic toll so they wanted uh, the some relaxations not that it, it actually happened because uh you know uh, they they kept um you know, imposing the curfew and then relaxing it a little bit so it um you know it, it was also like okay you know people are at home uh we we had nothing else to do than to pro protest also right so you know everyone was out on the streets every single day uh protesting and you know it, it just became a thing that's that's what everyone does you wait you wake up you get ready and then you go to the streets to protest the government and you know the initially it was in these very specific places where you traditionally have protests and then it started everywhere like in every lo uh, locality there would be these uh, uh, you know uh, groups of protests and even in this sort of big protest that was at Shuhid Minar um, I guess that the last one before the fifth was August 3rd um, and it was huge, right? Uh, but what was interesting is that it wasn't a centralized meeting, right? There were these, you know, lots of groups coming together. They were doing their own things, but they were unified on that, you know, one demand of uh, Hasina uh, stepping down. Sorry, that was very long. Hmm. But uh, very useful. Thanks a lot. And uh, my next question, and I have quite a few questions. Okay, okay sorry. So I'm going to try to be question... more on everybody's mind right now is uh, this new interim setup. Uh, the impression is that it will be controlled by the military. Please tell us something about uh, the political role of uh, Bangladeshi military because this country has a history since independence and before independence when it was a shared country with Pakistan as a history of military rules. 
uh, why was it that military intervened rather than any other uh, institutional or constitutional form of intervention, judiciary or parliament or something else? So Bangladesh has a very, very uh, problematic history with military rule. There's, you know, our history with, uh, with it is not a, a positive one. We don't have a positive experience with military rule. Um, so that has meant that there's always been some skepticism, right? Um, over and over again, you know, I think people think that, uh, you know, we, we have proof that the, that military governments don't work for us, right? Um, so I think what's what's also important here to think think about is you know, how long Hasina's tenure was. Fifteen years is a really long time, right? If you think about the development of political institutions, or rather, how political institutions also got decimated, right? These all turned into political entities. The judiciary wasn't independent. Uh, you know, they, they held political power in the parliament. Um, so it, you know, we've we've seen centralization take place in all political institutions. What was critical, also, I I think, is you know why 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 was it the military? Right? Because uh, you know no other entity would be able to provide, uh, I guess, law and order or take um, um, helm of the country. So uh, they they could have. Well, she did resign uh, um, with you know her resignation was submitted to the president. But I think um, after that, in terms of the transfer of power, there 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 was a vacuum, right? There was there was no other entity that it could go to. Um, this was the, but this 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 was one of the things that we kept hearing about during uh, the blackout also, or and then afterwards also that. Um, uh, the prime minister had wanted the military to play a partnership role with her, you know, to um, increase force, to uh, keep and maintain control over the country, but with her in the front, right? And the military, uh, well, I, I, I have no confirmation of this. This was this was all in the rumor mill. But the military refused. Uh, in retrospect, it, it seems like that was probably true because we would have otherwise seen that that they were not really interested in a partnership with Sheikh Hasina. They wanted uh, complete control or nothing, right? And uh, so uh, Sheikh Hasina had cultivated the military over the years, right? That they they were her biggest ally, right? um, and so, but clearly an ally that uh, at the last minute. Um, said that they were not willing to use more force. I think that's it. So the, the news um, indicates that uh, even in uh, the, the last uh, period, she had wanted uh, the military and the police to use more force to, and uh, maintain stability. And, uh, and the, the way they write about it is that they say that, you know, she um, couldn't accept that things were already out of control. Right, and so what it seems like is that uh, they, uh, you know, what's what's interesting is that you know this is like personalist politics, right? So the mil the chief of uh, army is actually uh, related to Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, right? Okay. Um, and so I don't know, uh, you know, what what that kind of dealings uh, would mean, but if uh, essentially they the only thing that they were willing to do was offer her safe passage, they were not willing to do anything else for her. At, at at that point, which is why she left. I mean, and that had its own thing, like, you know, I, I, you know why would you leave? I mean, that just uh, a couple of days ago, there's this video uh, uh, going on on social media that basically says, that's a, her her own video says that, oh, people are saying that, where is Hasina, where is Hasina? Hasina never uh, flees, you know? And, uh, you know, and that was the the impression that everyone had. No one actually expected her to leave. Why why would she leave, right? You know, Irshad uh, didn't leave. Khalid Azia didn't leave. They, they were all jailed for many, many years. She, Khalid Azia, you know, for 15. Um, uh, yeah, I think most of the 15 years she was, she was uh, actually on, in, in, in house arrest. So why why could she not um, do the same? And I think part of it is that I think um, she uh, and or those close to her uh, actually thought she would get killed, right? That that was the fear that you know the um, you know, there, there there's 
you know, when when her uh, residence got surrounded by protesters, uh, I think some some say that that's when she started to really fear for her life, and that's why she turned so repressive. You know, because you know people were kind of trying to th figure out why did she turn so repressive all of a sudden. You know, this this didn't really, and you know, you know there are ways in which she had been repressive uh, for a while, but not in this blatant fashion. Why did she become so blatantly repressive in in these few periods? Uh, the few days and um so part of the explanation i think people had was this sort of personalistic kind of an explanation that she really feared for her life when her uh residence got surrounded uh by protesters and she just uh freaked out and then she unleashed this kind of violence right that you know this kind of kind of personalist uh explanations also served to justify her actions too right that you know this was like a crazy moment and you know she's um, she didn't know what she was doing and so you know justifying it in a little bit mm, uh, so uh so her you know her her fleeing sort of caught everyone by surprise so yes yes so at, at that point in in that uh particular moment um so i I guess the, the 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 quick way to say this is that you know there are no other political institutions that were allowed to grow in her during her regime, and of course no other political party, right? All all most other political parties were uh, um, ba basically uh, well the the major opposition par party that was was there previously. Then they didn't even come for elections, so they weren't even officially an opposition party. So there was no other entity. Right. Um, she, you know, there, 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 there could have been a possibility where they, where, where she basically announces elections or she, you know, moves towards uh, change while staying there. Uh, but, but I think you know that that you know that would require some more sort of thinking through, you know, why why she fled, which is why I was talking about why she fled, and right? uh, and the politics of why uh, someone would flee flee. Right. So this this was almost like you know the Sri Lankan case, you know, you know fleeing, and uh, maybe uh, thinking that there would be some some kind of return. But um, what what we do know is that. Um, the the military didn't really uh, support her regime either right and so there's this popular uprising against her and she couldn't protect herself or nor could she um uh, maintain peace of force so the, why the military because there was no one else right if you want want some kind of legitimate transfer of power uh, uh there there just wasn't any other option if we listen to commentaries in the indian media which perhaps the uh, country outside of Bangladesh, besides Pakistan, most interested in the change there. Um, and, you know, sections of uh, civil society in Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, it has been seen as a setback for secularism in Bangladesh. Uh, it has been viewed, especially after some attacks on Hindu temples in certain districts. Uh, they have dominated the news, especially on social media while footage where uh, students and uh, ordinary citizens are uh, uh, protecting temples they have been marginalized how would you um, you know analyze the situation in relation to secularism which is very important question in indian uh, in in the uh, south asian region especially when we have a history of islamic fundamentalism in the two muslim majority countries Hindu fundamentalism in India and, you know, Buddhist fundamentalism in Sri Lanka, for instance? Um, you know, I think what's what's unfortunate is that all the political actors here gain from uh, an Islamist threat in Bangladesh, right? Everyone gains. You know, India gains because it justifies uh, their increased presence in the region because oh, we are going to go save Bangladesh. We, you know, we have we and uh, this is um, 
this this is why Indian uh, in, in in India's alliance with uh, the Bangladeshi military is Im, Im important. Uh, it allows um, uh, it had allowed Sheikh Hasina to maintain power for so many years. That's that's the the threat because it was always that you know uh, uh, keep me in power, vote for me because if you don't, then the Islamists will take over. Right? Um, not that there aren't some Islamists in the country. Of course, there are. Right, uh, but they, uh, you know, a uh, uh, marginal group is emboldened, finds uh, emboldenment when there are these political interests. Also, right, when uh, you know, uh, so uh, in the military, for example, Sheikh Hasina has allowed a number of um, well-known uh, is Islamists to enter. Um, so there, in, in, you know, there, there's there's a group called the Hifazut Islam, uh, which we might even call uh, Sheikh Hasina's own pet Islamist group that she can go after and uh, kill people from uh, when she needs to to show how good a job she's doing in countering uh, Islamism and uh, you know bring them up forward to show that hey look this there is an Islamist problem here and so it it does both of these things right. Um, the United States ben benefits from there being an Islamist threat because it uh, allies with their sort of Islamophobic understanding of uh, you know countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan and Afghanistan. So this 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 uh, a threat that uh, you know Bangladesh is going to turn into Pakistan or Afghanistan and that kind of a thing you know is is used both in internally and externally. You know, because th that allows for uh, uh, all kinds of justifications to intervene, to be more repressive. You know, pri primarily to be in, uh, more more repressive, right? And in doing so, uh, does it embolden the actual far right in Bangladesh? Of course, it does. You know, you know I'm not denying that there are. You know, there will be some. There are. You know, there there are uh, uh, right wing groups, fundamentalist groups everywhere, right? So the question is, when is it that they are they are emboldened? When is it that they feel that they can come out, right? Uh, and here, what we've we've seen is that you know. Uh, uh, this this interest, you know, the BNP has an interest in in uh, seeing this as an is Islamic uh, thing, also. Right? So th there's this interest in cultivating this Islamist threat. That look, there is this Islamist threat that we are all responding to, right? Everyone for their different reasons, right? And in in doing so, um, you know, creating a crisis that might otherwise actually not be such a crisis. So, for example, this Rajakar thing is exactly that. Right. The using uh, this uh, the Rajakar trope is basically saying that you know the you know the, the Rajakar and Islamist is basically synonymous here. Right? That it's, it's basically saying that if you don't uh, listen to us, then you are an Islamist, right? And then we're going to come uh, come after you. We're going to you know it's basically what the U.S. does with you know if you don't uh, you know uh, labeling everyone who's who's Muslim a terrorist here, everyone who doesn't uh, agree with a certain kind of. Um, uh, politics, or and and, and and you know, as this case shows, it's not even a certain kind of politics. If you if you don't agree about quotas, then you could also be an Islamist, right? So that's how ridiculous this has become. That you know, you use this sort of uh, terrorist label, and it's it's interesting also because you know, this is a certain kind of internalized Islamophobia, right? That this is the language that we borrowed from India, the language that we borrowed from uh, the United States to create this uh, uh, in internal uh, Islamophobia that we use to uh, clamp down on the people that we disagree with. You know, so there's this basic, you know, uh, polarization that uh, we create in order to uh, then clamp down um, using this kind of Islamist. So we sort of. Um, manufacture an Islamist threat uh, uh, and recognizing that it's in everyone's interest, everyone's political interest to keep this boogeyman alive. Okay, my next question is in the context of Indian subcontinent uh, in India, Pakistan, and I'm sure in Bangladesh itself, there would have been a lot of debate about vandalizing of Sheikh Mujib's um, statues, uh, monuments, even his home, which had been turned into some sort of museum. Uh, how would you uh, first please let us know uh, how different sections of Bangladeshi society have reacted to it, uh, especially in Pakistan, the mainstream media was projecting it as a rejection of Sheikh Mujib. Uh, the right wing forces, especially Jamaat-e-Islami was uh, very happy about it. 
likewise uh, uh, statist kind of sponsored media was doing the same a uh, lot of commentary in the indian media what symbolizes all this this is very interesting i was just telling someone that you know you know what kind of a daughter does this to her father to her dead father you know that it, it's it, you know, it's 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 really that she single-handedly turned him into a monster. You know, like every single thing became about her father. There, there would every you know, it's like every kitchen sink would have to be named after uh, Sheikh Mujib. Yeah. You know? uh, so yes, there was a period when no one could speak about him. Right, that it, uh, and no one could speak about his contributions, and you know, he he had, of of course, he's made significant contributions. It is under his leadership that Bangladesh became an independent country. That's absolutely right, but the way that she forced him down everyone's throats, just, you know, I think this is a response to that. Right, it's the degree to which she used his name over and over again, manipulated his vision, his name uh, to justify everything that she does, right? Uh, and, and to so, 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 sort of highlight everything that she, she does. Um, I think people were just sick of it, right? Because it, it became like, uh, you, know, you know, everyone, everything is about um, uh, Bongo Bondu Sheikh Mujib, right? So uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's not really a rejection of Sheikh Mujib him, himself because this generation doesn't even know Sheikh Mujib, right? All they know is what Sheikh Hasina put forward as what Sheikh Mujib had done, right? Which ended up being every single thing. Right, you know, it's it's a little bit like uh, you know what Modi does, right? You know, we we uh, we created uh, uh, plastic surgery. Look at Ganesha's face. You know, it's a little bit like that. You know, Sheikh Mujib had done everything, right? And so what? And, and you know, and 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 I think that's the the highest form of disrespect, right? Which then dilutes what he has actually done. So right? it it uh, turns um, everything that he has done. Uh, um, into something that might not have happened, right? It, it 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 introduces that doubt, that suspicion that oh maybe he didn't do that, right? Because you you are at you at a, at a stage when you are attributing everything to him, right? So that can't be, right? And so I think it's it's not, you know, the way that she put forward and portrayed Sheikh Mujib was a way in which no one w could or would have a very good sense of who who he actually was what he actually did in a sort of um um in a sympathetic way right uh so it it was it was basically shoved down people's throat and you know i think people were just tired of it people were just tired of seeing his images every everywhere a follow-up question to this because mm -hmm. uh it's a quite interesting debate for us especially in pakistan um mm -hmm. What I understand and what many academics would also argue and have argued that 1971, the war, uh, the, the, the war of liberation is very central to Bangladeshi identity as a nation state. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how does this vandalizing sort of complicates the official narrative now on? Because Bangladesh, Gona, of course, go on. So what will happen to the status narrative since 1971, despite Mujib's brutal murder itself, the war of 71 remains sort of central plank around which the Bangladeshi identity, uh, if I'm not wrong, is, is built upon. How would you comment on that? Sure, to to a certain degree, that is that is that is true. That you know, even in this round of um, uh, protests we see a lot of nationalistic trope that everyone's wearing the flag, everyone's using a flag bandana. So uh, there is this sort of limiting factor, right? That, you know, uh, everything is bounded by the nation state, right? Um, so, so yes, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, there, there are many uh, factors here. F first is, 
you know, uh, Pakistan never apologizing for what it had done in Bangladesh, right? This remains a thorn in uh, Bangladeshi identity, right? You know, how could you do this and never apologize, right? Um, what would happen? We don't know because it never happened, right? And so uh, there, there was this expectation that someone would acknowledge you know, the atrocities that happened in 1971, and that never came through, right? And so, uh, you know, think about how long it took for uh, the war crimes to even be acknowledged, and then, um, uh, you know, some sort of justice sought. What's unfortunate is that it happened, uh, you know, under such suspect conditions, right? We know where some, some people wanted to question the credibility of the tribunals and so on and so forth, right? You know, that could have been, you know, because this is, this is, a, this is you know, war, war crimes from 71 um, are, are well documented. There are people alive who can tell you of the atrocities, right? There is no need for a bungled up tri tri tribunal. And yet, uh, this was done in a fashion uh, under the Aumi League, uh, where you know people questioned its legitimacy, right? And so that so, so on on the on the one hand, it's the Aumi League that wants wanted to sort of say that oh, you know here you know all our uh, identity, a, Bang a Bangladeshi identity, is based on 1971 and the spirit of liberation and so on and so forth. And yet it's 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 also under the Aumi League that uh, or or rather even under the Aumi League that. Um, these kinds of questions remained open. You know, wh why why couldn't the, uh, we we actually um, get justice for what happened then? You know, at least with, with with those who were you know traitors and collaborators and you know implicated in war war crimes and move on, right? Um, and so this inability to move on had meant that the nationalist trope sort of remains, right? And so there there are those who would probably want to move on. And think think of a, a more global image for uh, Bangladeshis, but this these sort of uh, various counter narratives sort of disallowed that. Right? And I think there's this you know one one thing that that is probably true is that you know even before we could um, construct a narrative about 1971, there are all these counter narratives, right? And all these narratives about 1971 ended up being um, politically motivated. Every uh, political party has their version of 1971 and who the critical figures are. And uh, in these stories, it's always, you know, critical figures who brought independence, not the masses who actually brought independence. You know what I mean? So, uh, because this was a, a mass movement, it was a, there, was, there was mass mobilization, and yet, you know, this is Sheikh Mujib bringing us independence and gifting the country to us as if he did that single-handedly, right? And so that's the kind of narrative that we we, we we sort of got stuck with. And in order to show loyalty to a particular political party, you would take on that um identity, if you will, or that you will uh, take on that narrative as the one that describes um, your person, right? Your, you know, what is, which identity do you, do you uh, um, uh, identify with, right? So to that degree, uh, 1971 and where you uh, are, where you position yourself becomes very important, um, you know, in the sort of political sense, right? Because it's a, political position that you take rather than an identity that you you take on so two more questions but every question will have two parts one kindly let us know about the role of women in this movement and also let us know about student politics in general uh, in bangladesh in pakistan and the shared history pakistan and bangladesh had Students were very active, especially in the 1968 movement. But in Pakistan, 1980s onwards, there has been a ban on student unions, and there has not been really uh, a student politics, the kind of student politics we witness in many third world countries. So kindly comment on these two sections of the population or civil society, the students and the women's role in the present movement. The students uh, have been very 
uh, critical in all political milestones in Bangladesh. So right from 71, you know, before, even from before that, right, you know, from 54, the elections, and then in, in, in um, um, you know, the language movement of 52, you know, the election, the United Front election in uh, 1954, and then move, move, move all along, you know, the, the formation of um, and the various political parties in in uh, East Pakistan. Then you know, all of these were really uh, uh, student heavy. Right? These are uh, out of uh, student politics. Um, post post liberation, also uh, you know the the main uh, milestone is of course democratization in uh, the nineteen nineties, where again it was student movements. Um, and students who took to the streets, they're the ones who led uh, political change. This time too, I guess it's it's uh, you know interesting that the students didn't uh, necessarily come out to oust the government, but effectively that's what they had done. Right. So students have been very very uh, important now in the current discussions. You know, the, the, we we do sort of see. Um, you know, we are we are we are basically at at that juncture where we are trying to think about how to ensure that it doesn't become something where you know the students brought out brought about this political change, but it's the political leaders who become the beneficiaries, right? Because there is that possibility too, right? Okay, now that you, uh, that the uh, Hasina has gone, let us all go back to business. You will do what we always do, you know, the way in which. Um, Political parties work, so there's this 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 uh, uh, fear that will happen. But the students seem to be a little more. I don't know. At, at, at this point, they, they seem smarter than that, right? They've been uh, um, open to discussions and so on. Um, we've seen lots of women on the streets too throughout the movement, throughout the quota movement. You know, there were there were many many women. Um, uh, although I have to say that as um, the the number of coordinators who would be representing all of the coordinators um, got smaller in in order to go and meet different people and so on, that did become a little bit more men heavy, right? Um, so it's it's you know it's it's in interesting because you know. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina being a woman had meant that they could just talk about women's empowerment and assume that there's this, this certain level of women's empowerment just by virtue of the fact that she's a she's a woman, right? Um, uh, but I'll, I'll also say that you know there are quarters of uh, the population that see her um, leadership and her repressive uh, tendencies and you know sort of in a gendered way so i've seen people say that oh we don't we don't want legacy candidates we do not we don't want women as if to say that you know that would be like Sheikh Hasina, right um so you know it's 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 you know there there are women so what's what's hopeful also is that they just um announced the cabinet the advisory committee for the interim government so if uh, muhammad yunus of grameen bank fame he's going to um lead the interim government and he has i think 16 or 17 uh, advisors uh, and there are quite a number of i haven't counted maybe four or five women um which is um significantly more than um, uh, what we were seeing in lists that were coming out earlier. So you know, there are all these, I don't know, wish lists or fake lists, or here are the people that they're considering where there would be just one woman, right? So now I think there are like four or five and so on. Um, so women, but, but I think I, I'll also say that, you know, um, we do see a lot of women being active. Right. The, um, you know, uh, so there are various organizations that have been working. So, for example, um, the um, University Teachers Network, you know, um, that had been crucial, you know, partly because, you know, here are students protesting and then, you know, the next uh, level are professors. Right. So they're professors and so on. So the University Teachers Network is a network of university professors across the uh, country, but with a heavy uh, presence from Dhaka University, which is where most of these students are from, which is where most of the mobilizations uh, happen too. Um, and so there you see a lot of women, you know, a lot of women uh, professors out there. So and there's been a lot of participation uh, from women, from students. Yes.
Okay, uh, one last question again with two parts. Some of the left groups, they were allied with uh, Hasina and perhaps they were even part of the coalition government. Um, what was their role in this movement? Did they side with Hasina and being allies or were they part of the movement? Secondly, uh, the question on everybody's mind, um, the, the left globally, especially in South Asia, how should the left uh, relate to the change that has happened? And uh, perhaps a third question or third part of the question, um, what, what demands should be there? And what kind of perspective we can build? What should we expect? Well, the 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 traditional left in Bangladesh has been very disappointing. I have to say, they, uh, as you correctly pointed out, they allied with the Army League. They, they basically do the left. Uh, they do yeah, they do the work for Army League. They say some progressive things, but then they are, they're ultimately uh, part of the Army League. You know, there's there's not much else that happens there. Um, uh, during this movement, we have not really seen much uh, there. In fact, uh, we've seen uh, some of them being very critical of students, uh, you know, being very patronizing, scolding them. Um, you know, use, again, they, you know, there's, you know, our our left parties have an Islam problem too, right? They, uh, you know, our left parties sort of. Uh, take on this reductionist stance right it's only class that matters everything else doesn't even exist right but they wouldn't even acknowledge you know this is a country where 90 percent of the population is muslim you have to take that into consideration it doesn't mean that 90 percent of the population are fundamentalists but they are practicing muslims right um and so there has to be some space for them in uh, or at least acknowledgement that it's okay to be religious and leftist but not in in these kinds of circles Right, and so this this rejection of religion um, uh, often has meant that um, you know they they are sort of sidelined. You know, they're they no they're they're not a big force at all. So um, them coming out wouldn't actually mean that much either. So, but they do. You know, they're they they do have some some role. They are able to bring out some people who are sort of committed to causes of social justice and so on. Um, we we so so that's the that's the traditional left. But you know, there are other sort of left leaning uh, organizations. So, Gono um, Shonghoti Andalon. Uh, which is sort of left leaning, uh, but not exactly like the traditional left. In that, their their orientation is all is more like Maulana Pashanis, where you know who is the red Maulana, right? You know that okay, you know we we um, pay some attention to religiosity too, except that is um, there, that that actually exists, right? Um, so uh, they have been uh, pretty, pretty active. So their student organization, uh, Chatra Federation, they've been uh, very active in uh, the quota movement. Well, actually, uh, some some of these um, other uh, student organizations too, you know, Chatra Front and um, so on. I think they were they were also fairly active. They're the student wings of the more traditional left parties. So the student wings of of so this this um, quota movement. You did see uh, uh, in involvement of uh, you know uh, various various groups. Uh, what was what, what the the characteristic, however, was that there was a very divided group. Right? So uh, there were uh, people who wanted uh, no quotas to people who wanted a variety of quotas on uh, on the basis of say region and uh, class status and gender and so on. Right? So you know, there, there, it was very divisive. So which is why I said that you know there was potential for a lot of discussion, but it so just got thwarted with uh, you know repression. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, in 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 terms of you know uh, any kind of political position, so none of the um, uh, traditional left were really there, but the the more so, you know, so not the left, but sort of the progressive parties. They were they were kind of um, yeah, out there with the students. What next, uh, or uh, you know how how to relate? I think you know the 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 biggest thing, of course, is democracy. Right, that's that's the the one thing that everyone should be 
asking for okay? uh, representative democracy, participatory democracy, um, uh, with with the representation from all across the board. I think what we uh, periodically see is um, you know workers being left out, peasants being left out. You know, so uh, you know as you do see in bourgeois democracies, right? And so countering that would be the challenge here in that you know what would alter alternatives look like so uh the the fear here of course is that you know this movement would uh, you know uh basically benefit the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, which was the oldest, um, you know, the form, former opposition party. And, and so if there are elections today, that's the party that comes into power. So if that happens, then, you know, effectively what this turns into is this entire movement for the BNP, which is not what this was about, really, right? That, you know, the, uh, the students, you know, people here actually do want democracy. We want, we would, we, we, we want multi-party democracy, right? We want participatory democracy. We want a democracy where there's rep representation from different groups. And that is where the challenge is. You know, where will these alternatives come from? Who will, uh, you know, be able to come forward? And uh, is, is there, you know, what are the various options? Can we experiment with various forms, say like proportional representation and, and so on, right? Um, so what would participatory um, democracy look like? And so I think that's where, you know, uh, we need um, uh, support too. And, you know, uh, so you know, but, but like, like I said uh, before, the challenge, of course, is how uh, there are vested interests in creating this Islamist threat. If you do uh, successfully do that, then you you thwart all chances for that, because then it again becomes this dichotomous thing, right? That, okay, we need to save ourselves from this Islamist threat, and we'll take anything, right? We'll accept anything except for that, uh, for the Jamaat Islami, for example, right? And so that, that becomes a, 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 a very... Uh, polarized and a very dichotomous kind of uh, uh, solution, right? Where anything becomes acceptable, even the BNP, right? And we move out of any possibilities of uh, a sort of progressive future. Thank you very much.